Good morning. Better? Better? Wow, this is kind of fun. Although, you know, I was thinking, I was kind of excited when I got that little email from Ed a few minutes ago that said, oh, we're having some technical difficulties, we're not going to be visiting the service. I'm like, yes, I don't have to behave. And then he said, but, you know, we'll tape it and then we'll play it again, so I guess I have to behave after all. Anyways, it's really good to see everyone here. Welcome. Welcome everyone who's here. If you're visiting, thrilled to have you here. And if you're regular, we're thrilled to have you here. And if you're listening online, I'm very happy to have you listen in and hope that you can join us some day in person. Um, I was sitting here thinking, I don't know how many of you watch old movies, that's kind of my era of movies, and I was thinking, like a bunch of bank robbers, train robbers, sitting in the in the congregation here, all with your little mask on. I'm going to do the announcements first, and I don't see too much uh, different than last week. Um, I guess we're just kind of carrying on and waiting for Tuesday to see what kind of announcements come out and how we might change, change things here. So we'll wait with anticipation for that announcement. Um, continue to pray for Ben and Claire's family. We lost him uh, to COVID recently, and they have four children, and of course, his wife and just the entire family and kind of family. So let's continue to pray for them. And for Jim's eye, we pray for God to continue to heal. In that regard, for anyone else, also for Tim Sales' um, heart. And we also have to give you to know that needs just that little special touch or that little special love that's being given the call of our speech to the community for the way we can So I encourage you to do that. Um, I'm going to read from, oh, actually, hold on, I've got to do one other thing. Elaine has a letter that she wants to read from the Pizza Lake Bible. All right, good morning, everybody. Just wanted to bring some news from the board at Utsalik Bible Camp. Um, we learned uh, late last week that summer camps all over British Columbia are allowed to run this year um, for overnight camps, so we were pretty excited about that. And it was a little unexpected. We had sort of been saying, you know, we'll do what we can, but chances are we won't be able to. So we were really excited to see that we were going to be able to go ahead. So we sent a letter to all the churches because we believe in the ministry of camp and the power of prayer and the body of Jesus coming together to meet the needs in our community. The world needs the gospel message of Jesus more than it ever has, and in that it is vital that our children discover their own personal faith so they can live it out in the 21st century. So in order to run a camp this summer, we need assistance. We need you, the Church of Jesus Christ, to the Lakes District, Grassy Plains, Decker Lake, Burns Lake, and beyond, to come together, to work together, to serve together, so that we can provide our children with an opportunity to find their faith, have some fun, and discover the love of Jesus. So at the moment, we're just thinking, like, if we can do one week, that would be great. We're going to shoot for grades four to seven, and we're hoping maybe in August, August 8th. So we need almost everything you can imagine right now. Cooks, cabin leaders, assistants, a nurse or first aid attendant, lifeguard, activity coordinators, and a ministry team. Um, and not to mention prayer. If you're available, we can use you. We do not have any time to lose. So you can get a hold of either Sheldon or myself. Sheldon's cell number is 250-961-1546. I'm supposed to be on my paper and this is the wrong one. <laughs> we recognize this is a long shot. However, we believe in the church and that there are people who can give of themselves for this extraordinary moment in time. If you are in, we must know by June 16th, so I believe that's Wednesday at 4 o'clock. So this will allow us time to make plans and to begin preparation in earnest. In conclusion, we believe in the ministry. We believe there are better days ahead and that there is an exciting opportunity ahead of us in the summer. It's so important that we begin, as the prophet Zachariah says, do not despise these small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. Please pray for Utsa, pray for the children, and if God is nudging you, say yes to camp in 2021. Thank you, Elaine. So prayerfully consider that request, and I'm sure if I was to ask for a show of hands, many here had significant uh, visits you know, with God when they were children at camp, and, and it made a lifelong change in our hearts, and so I urge you to consider that request. I'm going to read Psalm 148, 1-14, and this is a psalm. It's a psalm that calls all things in creation to praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise Him in the heights above. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his heavenly hosts. 
Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the skies. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. He set them in place forever and ever. He gave a decree that will never pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures and all ocean depths. Lightning and hail, snow and clouds, stormy winds that do his bidding. You mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild animals and all cattle, small creatures and flying birds, kings of the earth and all nations, you princes and all you rulers on earth, young men and maidens, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His splendor is above the earth and the heavens. He has raised up for his people a horn, the praise of all his saints of Israel, people close to his heart. Praise the Lord. So I'm going to try something super high tech here. I have a few examples of choirs in nature in the place. I hope this works. That's not okay. Okay, there's an ad. Just give me a second. It's coming. It's coming. Here we go. So, I give me one second. Just super cool. Now, for you, of you, for those of you who operate machinery, like me, you probably thought that was somebody backing up, and that was the backup thing. That's actually a northern saw with owl, little tiny owl, that can make that amazing sound. Okay, and here's my other one to play for you. This was my walk yesterday. The fire out of here. singing yesterday morning to me as I was walking. And I was in awe of creation, but I was more in awe of the Creator and um, that time of just being able to worship as we walk in nature and worship the Creator. I'll read a couple little excerpts from a couple more songs. Psalm 19, 1 to 4. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of His hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the end of the world. And Psalm 151, 2 and 6. Praise the Lord. Praise God in the sanctuary. Praise him in his heavens, in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Let's open the prayer. Dear God, we're so thankful for your love and your goodness to us. We're thankful that when we speak the name of Jesus, we know that all of heaven is attentive and we're so, uh, we feel so blessed to be in your house today together. We feel blessed that we are able to hear the sounds of nature and the praises that your creatures that you created sing and pray, praise you with. We pray that you be with us now as we praise you with song, we praise you with our worship, and that we learn from you 
and we pray that you be with us and with those who are at home and aren't able to be here. And that you fill the rooms where they are right now with your love and goodness. We thank you for your goodness and love. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have your Bibles, will you turn with me to Colossians chapter 3? Colossians chapter 3, I'll read uh, the first 17 verses. Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits on the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things on, of earth. For you died to this life and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in his glory. So put to death the sinful, earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Don't be greedy, for the, a greedy person is, a, as, is an idolater, worshipping the things of this world. Because of these sins, the anger of God is coming. You used to do these things when your life was still part of this world, but now is the time to get rid of anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, and dirty language. Don't lie to each other, for you have stripped off your old sinful nature and all its wicked deeds. Put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your Creator and become more like Him. In this new life, it doesn't matter whether you are a Jew or Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, bar barbaric, uncivilized, slave or free. Christ is all that matters, and he lives in all of us. Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember the Lord forgave you and you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourself with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ, or sorry, and let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts, for as members of one body you are called to live in peace and always be thankful. Let the message about Christ in all its richness fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom he gives. Singing, sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to the Lord with thankful hearts. And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God our Father. Amen. This morning, as has been mentioned, I, I, I have the opportunity to introduce my brother as the speaker for this morning. I was thinking, uh, we, we've been uh, especially busy preparing our yard for sod and, and getting that ready. And we've, with the help of many friends, we now have grass on our yard and it looks so much different. But, you know, it's, it's been kind of exhausting. And uh, sometimes I've gone to the fridge I open the fridge, and I stare at the fridge for a while, and then I realize, oh, what I'm looking for is in the pantry, and it's just like my head is in a bit of, it has been in a bit of a fog, and so I'm so glad that I asked my brother Courtney to, uh, to speak to us here this week, and uh, the Lord bless you as you share the word with us, and may we all be challenged to follow the Lord. Thank you, Ed. I was just commenting to Don on her way here this morning. The last time we were here was just the beginning of COVID, and uh, much water has gone under the bridge since then. And we seem to be coming out the other end, and I'm so thankful. It's nice to be able to come into the sanctuary. Um, even though we're hampered in ways of worshiping together, we can worship together, and it is so good to be able to do that again. So. It's really a pleasure to be here with you. So, yes, we'll be looking at Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 17. But before we begin, let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that uh, we can learn from it. We can go to it at any time. It is always available to us. So, Lord, I pray that you just open our eyes and our hearts to what you have to say to us this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So our passage this morning, if you have your Bibles open, begins with, I actually, I'm reading from the NIV. What, I like what, how that was. It really complimented and gave it a little different angle, too. I'll be going from, with the yeah, NIV. So it'll uh, be a little bit different wording, but the same, same idea. So in the NIV, the passage this morning begins with two words that kind of direct where we will be going. In the NIV, it says, since then. These two words are much like the word therefore, and uh, it is used, and therefore is used in many translations of chapter 3. They point us back to what has already been said. So I would like us to take a quick look back because context, as you know, is crucial when we're looking at a passage, and especially when we have the words since then or therefore. So in chapter 1, verses uh, 10 and 12, Paul tells the church in Colossae the desire he has for them and what he hoped would be the result of the letter that he was writing. First off, he, his desire was that they would live a life worthy of the Lord and would please him in every way. That they would bear good fruit, bear fruit in every good work grow in the knowledge of God, be strengthened in the power so that they would have great endurance, patience, and joy. And thus, be thankful to God for the wonderful gift of salvation, our inheritance given to us through Christ. That, in a nutshell, is Paul's purpose for writing this letter to the first, um, first century church. And that is what God desires for us today as well. In the following verses, verses 15 to 23, Paul lays out the evidence and the truth of Christ's supremacy. That Christ is, is God incarnate. We see that in verses 17 to 18. That he is all we will ever need. Then he presents himself as a servant of God and commissioned by God to the reveal this mis the mystery which is Christ Jesus. This letter penned by Paul was intended to be an encouragement, to unite his audience in love. In chapter 2, he points out that we have been given this wonderful, wonderful gift, that we are to live lives rooted and built up in Christ, strengthened in our faith and overflowing with thankfulness. But Paul warns that there are forces that seek to take us captive, causing us not to live in victory. And that kind of is our, my little look back. So those are the, what has happened before in, in the book of Colossians up to this point. My first computer I ever had, I bought off my nephew. It was well before Windows. Um, computers were quite new. And they're definitely new to me. And the systems that they used were foreign and completely confusing for me. My nephew had told me about all these wonderful things computers could do. But for me, I was unable to do anything with it, so it just sat there in the corner gathering dust. The computer was capable of all the things he had told me, but until but, to put it, um, but un unless I put it into use, it was no use to me. This is how we easily slip into living after we have been given this new life in Christ. We have all the promises, benefits, potential that comes with this new life in Christ, yet it's easy to get bogged down by the things of this world, not benefiting or using what we have been given. But unlike my computer, where I didn't have what it took to be able to um, take advantage of what it offered, God has given us everything we need to be successful in our walk with Christ. So as we read um, chapters 3, 1 to 17, our passage this morning, Paul exhorts us to set our hearts 
upon heaven and to take our eyes off of the world. So let's read again, read verses 1 through 3. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. In the previous chapters, Paul has told us about the privileges we now have in Christ. And here again, in these first couple of verses, he, we are reminded of what God has done for us. The old self no longer exists. It is gone, it says in verse 1. It says, we have died and been raised with Christ, and our lives are now hidden with Christ in God, verse 3. These are things that God has done for us. We have no part in them. This is a gift from God. This is the reality of the gift of new life given to us by the Heavenly Father. So because of these wonderful truths of what we have received from God, we are told what our response is to be, how we are now to live our lives. We are to set our hearts and minds on things above. and take our eyes off of this world. When a person sets their heart and mind on something, we become fixated by it. It controls our being, our thinking. We are passionate about it. Whatever I have set my heart upon. I have an example, but it's a really poor example. When I set my heart and mind on, say, the perfect house that I want, like I said, it's a poor example set my um, heart and mind on the house on the lake, wherever it may be, what your perfect house would be. You can't stop thinking about it. You constantly, you, if you have an opportunity, you want to tell people about this place that you found, or at least it's in your mind, and it comes up in your conversation. Nothing will deter you in the quest of obtaining this house. You will sell your previous house, and you'll be willing to take on likely more debt in doing so. I won't stop until that place is mine. You could say it's become my prime objective. Single-minded focus and resolve. That is what Scripture tells us is to be our response for what God, through Christ, has done for us. The things of this world pale in comparison and only serve to distract us and derail our focus. The New American Standard Bible puts it this way. I like that's this translation as well. Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking things above, the things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. We are told to keep seeking. This seeking and setting our hearts and our minds and things above on Christ isn't a one-time event, but it's something we must continually, intentionally do. Another uh, paraphrase, I love how the, the message puts it. So if you're serious about living this new resurrection life in Christ, act like it. Pursue things over which Christ presides. Don't shuffle along eyes on the ground, absorbs the things right in front of you, look up and be alert to what is going on, on around Christ. That's where the action is. See things from his perspective. In Matthew 14, we have the account of Jesus walking on water. We are told this event happens on the fourth watch of the night, which puts it between three and six in the morning. It's dark. So the disciples are, um, yes, it's dark, and it says the disciples were in the boat and were being buffeted by the, the winds. There's a storm. The Sea of Galilee was, was known for its storms. They would come up out of nowhere. The winds would come down the hills and hit the sea, and, and bang, there would be a storm. And they could be some serious storms, and still are. 
Peter is in a boat, along with the other disciples. It's very dark, likely because of the, the clouds and everything. There's no sun or no moon, no moon or stars to be seen. So it's very dark. In verse 29 and 30, it says, Then Peter got... No, no, back up a little bit. Um, then those in the boat see Jesus approaching. He's walking on the choppy, churning sea. Peter, in his amazement and in his impulsiveness, asks Jesus if he can come out and walk to him. And Jesus invites him to do so. Then, uh, verse 29 to 30, Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind... He was afraid and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. As long as Peter's eyes were fixed on Jesus, all went well. He was able to do the unthinkable. He was able to walk on the water. But as soon as he took his eyes off of the Lord, what happened? He began to sink. When his focus was no longer fixed on Jesus, but rather on his physical and his immediate circumstances, he began to sink. It was only when he looked back to Jesus and called out to him that he didn't sink and he reached out to Jesus for help. His focus, when his focus returned to Jesus, you could say he became fixated on Jesus for his, for his help. That's why Paul beseeches us, as followers of Christ, so to set our hearts on things above. When we set our minds on earthly things rather than things above, we begin to sink, not unlike Peter. The cares of this world, the immediacy of today, all those distractions, the allure of this world, cause us to lose our focus, and we are in danger of being swallowed up by them. Paul reminds us that we have died to the, the way of life and our, our life is now hidden with Christ in God. In verse 5, we are told to put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to earthly nature. It doesn't say control your, your nature, but rather put it to death. Strong words. We are then given a list of some of the things that should no longer be part of of a life hidden in Christ. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed. The list continues in verse 8. So we are to rid ourselves of anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language, lying. This isn't meant to be an exhaustive list, but rather examples of things that are inconsistent and have no place in the life we now have with Jesus. So let's read verses 4 to 10. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways, in the life you once lived. But now you must also rid yourself of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off the old self with his practices and have put on the new self, to wit, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of your Creator. Though we have been born again, born anew, we still have this sin nature that we have to battle. And we will have it until we go home to meet the Lord. Thus, it needs to be continually put to death. To set our hearts and our um, affections on, on um, heavenly things, it is our duty to subdue these vicious habits of our mind that seek to remove our eyes off the things of God. Just like weeds that sprout up and threaten to take over a garden, if they are not yanked out and yanked out by the roots, 
they will infest and take over. So we must continually weed out our natural inclinations, yanking them out by the roots. We all used to walk in this way. This is what we were. This is how we acted before we were given this new life. And left unchecked, these are the default settings, unless our eyes are firmly set on things above. Yet many of these sins that don't align themselves with how we are to live are like weeds that disguise themselves and are not easily spotted. But those roots will run deep. Any of these sins named here by Paul, or others for that matter, can easily take over if left unchecked. Verse 7 here in our passage says, We used to walk in these ways. This was the way we operated. This is used to be our focus, but no longer to be so. Verses 9 and 10, Since you have taken off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge and the image of its creator. We get the image, imagery here of taking off old, raggedy clothing, filthy, stinky clothes, and putting on brand new, clean, pressed, beautiful designer clothing. And this happens, it says, as we are renewed in the knowledge of Christ. As we immerse ourselves in God's word, getting to know him more and more in the knowledge of him, in a relationship with him, he transforms us. He transforms our lives. Romans 12, 1, 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. 2 Corinthians 3.18 And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into the image which with ever increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. It is God's desire to transform us. This is the renewing work that he wants to do inside of us. Renewing us in in his knowledge, in the knowledge of him. Renewing us in the image of Jesus. Continue reading verse 11. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. God's desire is that for everyone, it doesn't matter where you've been, what you've gone through, who you are, each and every one is offered this new life. He wants to adopt each and every one of us as his children and be, make us heir, his heirs. Verses 12 to 14. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, close yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Here again, we have the word, therefore. Because of all the things that we've been told up to this point, all the things God has done for us, we read that we are God's chosen people holy and dearly loved. That is who we are. Isn't that just amazing? You and I have been chosen. Chosen by God himself. Because of the gift of salvation, we are in his eyes holy. We are dearly loved by him. Therefore, having discarded the filthy clothes of sin, the clothes that showed us for who we were, we are now clothed clothed ourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, forgiveness, and most of all, love. 
as we set our hearts and minds on things above rather than the things of this world, as we continually put to death the old self, taking off the old self, Jesus will transform our lives. Just as a person who may be going to court and be going before a, a judge, the lawyer will often advise such a person to uh, get a haircut, shave, put on a suit and tie, wash up, because there's something about appearance that makes a person respectable. But unlike physical clothing can, that can disguise the reality, when we put on these, cl these clothings that we have just been talking about, they're genuine. And it's a proof of the radical change in our lives with what God has done in, to transform us. These new virtues that we clothe ourselves in will be evidence to all those around us. Final two verses, three verses, verses 15 and 17. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, since as members of one body you are called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing to God with grateful, with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. As we set our hearts and our minds on Jesus, we are told to let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts. Our old self was at odds with God. But now we have an attitude of peace that only Christ can give us. The comfortable sense of his acceptance and favor with God. Matthew Henry puts it this way. A disposition to peace among yourselves, a peaceable spirit that keeps the peace and makes the peace. And this peace is to rule our hearts, along with thankfulness, with gratitude in our hearts to God. And finally, because of the wonderful gift of salvation given to us, we are to let the word of God dwell in us. How? Dwell in us richly. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach, admonish one another. We too often think of teaching as being certain people's um, professions or their gift. You think of pastors, Sunday school teachers, so, so on. But that's not so. As the word of Christ dwells in us, and our hearts and minds are set on things above, we will naturally teach and admonish one another because the word of Christ dwells in us richly. You probably know why people put blinders on horses especially when they are pulling loads or are in races. Blinders are a piece of leather, can be leather or plastic, that are attached to the bridle. And they prevent the horse from seeing to the rear or to the sides. They, re they wear them to reduce their field of vision and stay focused on the task. You see, horses are prey animals that have survived through the ages relying on their instinct to take flight when they perceive danger. Horses believe to avoid harm depends on their ability to put distance between themselves and danger. Horses' eyes are positioned on the sides of their head, giving them 350 degree range of vision. But having great peripheral vision comes at a trade-off. Their visual perception is unclear. The function of the blinders is to keep the horse from being distracted and pay attention to its task, to what is ahead of them. We also need blinders. We need spiritual blinders to help us stay focused on Jesus, to not become distracted by the things of this world, not allow our natural instincts to kick in. Setting 
our hearts and minds on things above. And because of where our hearts and our minds reside, we will sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in our hearts to God. Despite what's happening in the world, especially today, we won't be tempted to complain, fret, criticize. Those things are a result of having our eyes on the things of the world. But rather, with our hearts and minds set on Jesus, we will praise our Father in heaven, encouraging those around us. With single-minded focus, with hearts and minds set on things above, we march on. Robed in the new custom-made clothing that God has given us and have his label on them. Dressed in compassion, kindness, humility, being even-tempered, quick to forgive, and above all, in a garment of love. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for radically changing us from what we were. Help us to remain and stay focused on you. There are so many things in life that will cause us to become distracted, become frustrated, become whatever. But Lord, we, we are told to, to keep our eyes on you, just like Peter in the water. If we keep our eyes on you and focus on you instead of what's happening around us, we won't sink. And Lord, I just pray that for each and every one of us, that you will remind us in times of trouble and in good times to always focus on you and the, and the things of heaven. Thank you, Lord, for these people here. Bless them and keep them. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Reminds me of the song, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus, and the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glorious grace. I think that's how it goes. So may you, as you go from here, uh, turn your eyes upon Jesus and be filled with gratitude and thankfulness as you uh, give him praise and you serve one another. Just a reminder again as we exit uh, to, it's a beautiful day outside, so exit and uh, do your visiting outside and that's a little, probably a little bit better rather than getting bottlenecked up here. So uh, thank you, uh, Corny, for sharing the word with us. Such a powerful, beautiful section of scripture and uh, so applicable to our lives. May the Lord bless you and keep you and may his face shine upon you as you go from here. Take care. God bless.